partner dots. That's human touch intelligence is a great um, complement to our smart data approach and political monitoring. I wish everyone great insights into the German presidency. <laughs> Uh, Lona is a deputy editor of the Parliament magazine. She has 20 years experience as a journalist and has been reporting on the EU in Brussels since 2004. Lona, the screen is yours. David, um, can I just remind everyone to please submit your questions for Dr. Lisa and our consultants by posting them in the chat in English, please. Uh, please also feel free to post them throughout the interview and the presentations. Uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to Dr. Peter Lisa. We're delighted to have you today. Uh, so let's kick off with the interview. Um, Dr. Lisa, uh, Germany took over the rotating EU presidency July the 1st in the middle of an increasingly tumultuous and uncertain time amid a global pandemic which has wreaked havoc on people's lives, health, the global economy. How would you say this global crisis has affected the German EU presidency? Yeah, of course, it has affected uh, the German presidency very much. It starts already with technical issues. You know, I had a technical problem. I really don't know what happened because normally I work with uh, this uh, technology frequently and I'm happy to do because it enables us to, to work on different places. I was in Berlin yesterday, in Hamburg this morning, and now I'm with you in Brussels. But there was a technical problem, and uh, also the, the German presidency may suffer from these technical problems. So it is a bit more difficult to continue the agenda that was foreseen before the COVID-19 crisis uh, happened. And then, of course, we have a completely other setting of the, of the agenda to fight the crisis and not only the health issues, but also the economic issues, is priority number one. And it was not on the agenda when the Germans discussed their priorities. So it's obvious, but I'm very grateful that the German presidency still continues on some other important issues like the climate law, or in the area of health, also the HDA and, and other issues. On top of the points that are now more important, the economic recovery and also the, the priorities in the health area, a better coordination when we uh, answer the COVID challenge, but also um, more self-sufficiency, um, more independence from China and India when it comes to material like uh, personal protective material or pharmaceuticals, this comes on top, but the other issues are still important and uh, it's a challenge, but I trust my fellow colleagues in Germany, the ministers and especially the chancellor to, to cope with this huge challenges. Yes, indeed. Um, actually, that leads perfectly into my next question. Um, obviously, Germ Germany is under a great deal of pressure to turn this Corona presidency into a success. Um, do you think that Berlin can live up to these high expectations and, and help lay the groundwork for the EU27 to, to manage to emerge stronger from the crisis? You know, uh, I'm a member of the government party, of the ruling party in Germany, the CDU, and that's why I, I always have to praise my people and uh, yeah, that's why I will do it also now. But of course, you know, there are, there are not only the best possible, the most clever people in, in any government. So you have stronger and not so strong people. But I have uh, full trust, especially in the chancellor. Angela Merkel is very experienced and she managed Germany well in this pandemic. And she has also an ambition to make the German presidency successful. So this, this is really important. And when it comes to health, Minister Jens Spahn has proved in Germany already before the pandemic that he's really delivering. So there were so many initiatives on things that were urgently uh, to be addressed. And unfortunately, a long time ago, the government didn't address. Now he, he made it. And he will also make a difference in the presidency. So 
I think, especially in these two positions, Chancellor and Health Ministers, we can expect a lot from the German presidency. Okay. Um, now, looking at more of a, an e, a general EU um, picture of things, what are your thoughts on the often uncoordinated and often haphazard response from member states dealing with the coronavirus? For example, member states requiring varying lengths of quarantine when returning from risk areas. Um, do you think that in order to reduce confusion among EU citizens and businesses, should we have general EU rules covering all member states? Yeah, we should have a more coordinated approach. That was something that my political group already asked for in March when the corona pandemic started. And it's more urgent than ever after seeing this uh, uncoordinated approach on the, on the travel season. And uh, unfortunately, we have an increase of COVID-19 in some countries more than in others, but almost all EU countries see an increase after the travel season. So something needs to be done, but it needs to be in a coordinated way. And um, I think what is uh, of particular uh, importance that all the measures of the member states should be based on facts and not on political consideration. In my view, the worst example is Hungary, they closed the border to almost all EU countries, except the Visegrad. But when you look at the figures, Czech Republic has quite high rates of infection, significantly higher than other countries like Finland, where they exercise a travel ban. So this is completely unacceptable. And, you know, some, some mm, responsibility for the member states should remain because when you have a lower rate of infections, you don't need the same kind of measures. But when you have the same rate, you should have the same measures. And member states should coordinate better, uh, especially when it comes to traveling from one country to another. It is disturbing. It is uh, unfair for those that are treated worse than the others. But it is also undermining the credibility of citizens in the measures. So when you don't apply them in the same way, based on science, based on figures, um, then the trust of people will get lost. We were very lucky in most of the European countries that people followed the advice of the government. Uh, they respected the rules, at least 90%. And uh, this could be put in danger if it continues to be so uncoordinated and so contradictory. Um, um, now you're a vocal proponent of a European health union. Um, in the past, EU member states have said that health should remain very much a national concern and that Europe should stay out of it. Um, now, given the outbreak and the rapid spread of COVID-19, do you think that a European health union could be now more widely embraced uh, with the stark realisation that viruses and other health threats don't stop at borders? Definitely. Um, it has never been true that health is purely a national issue. And uh, I was quite shocked when yesterday in the Committee for Environment and Health, the Deputy Director General of the European Commission just said, oh, health is a national issue. It was never. We have a treaty. And in this treaty, there's a lot talk about health. There is, of course, a clear reference to what is the responsibility of the member states. We in Europe, we are not allowed to dictate how they finance, how they organize their hospitals, what kind of treatment is compensated and what is not. This is national politics, and I don't want to interfere with that. But there are other issues that are for a long time already European politics. For example, every vaccine that will be approved in the European market has to be approved under European law, most of them by the European Medical Agency. And, and all the companies that are trying to develop a vaccine against COVID-19 are talking to EMA and not to the national authorities. 
And there are many, many other issues that we already did in the past. There was a backslash, there was a kind of break for European health policy in the last five years, because to be honest, we had a very weak health commissioner, a very good, honest man, but he was not strong enough to convince uh, the college. And also Jean-Claude Juncker, unfortunately, uh, didn't give the right priority. He knows it from myself already for three years that I'm disappointed here. So, um, but the crisis showed us more than ever that we need to address many more issues at European level. The ECDC, our authority for infectious diseases, is very, very understaffed. They don't have the power to, to do what is necessary. And even if they have a clear scientific position, they are not allowed to give recommendations. You know, we have an institution, but they are not allowed to give recommendations. That is part of the problem. The member states have always this Pavlov reflex that say health is for the member states. It was never true. And I'm very happy that more and more uh, also member states representatives understand that it is to be addressed at European level. Uh, for example, the strengthening of the ECDC has been um, supported by Jens Spahn already in March, in the beginning of the pandemic, and we are ahead of a very concrete proposal of the European Commission. But it shouldn't be limited to the pandemic. You know, we want to fight cancer, and especially when it comes to rare cancer, when it comes to cancer in children, when it comes to very specialized, personalized medicine. We need the European cooperation to, to have the best outcome for our patients. Uh, I could, you know, I, I don't want to be too long, I could list much more issues where respecting the, Europe, uh, the, the European treaties, we could do much more than we did in the past. And I'm very happy that this uh, position is also getting more and more support at member states level. Thank you. Um, looking more specifically at Germany, um, the latest Deutschland train survey uh, highlighted that the vast majority of everyday Germans are satisfied with the governing Grand Coalition's response to the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis. What lessons, if any, do you think the EU can take from Germany's response to the pandemic? Yeah, so in fact, we, we exercised a big... Uh, change of the political mood in Germany. The European election were a disaster for the governing parties, for my party, CDU, but also for the Social Democrats. And now, especially, CDU is getting more and more support. I think this is mainly due to the, the, the role of Angela Merkel. She's a scientist, and she was able to explain the threat of COVID-19 in a very um, in a very calm way, so not uh, dramatic speeches, but very clear, science-based, and people trusted her. And uh, that's the reason why um, the German government is more popular now. Um, I think, in a way, we were lucky. You know, we had the opportunity to prepare ourselves better than Italy and Spain, because obviously the virus came later to Germany in a large quantity. So it was in Germany already in January. We obviously managed to control a very small outbreak, but uh, that was a, an alert for everybody. And when we saw the dramatic scheme, uh, schemes in Italy, we could react um, more fast. And uh, that's why we were lucky, but also um, the German government managed the crisis quite well with a balanced approach. Uh, fortunately, we didn't go for a complete lockdown. It was necessary in, in other parts of Europe, but not in Germany, because we, we were able to control it in an earlier stage. And until now, you know, there are always mistakes. Not everything is perfect. I have a lot to criticize also in details in Germany. But overall, we managed to keep it under control. And uh, yeah, I think that is a lesson to be learned, to be uh, 
not too alarmistic, but at the same time to be very serious, take the disease serious and explain the right measures to the population. Okay. Uh, now, I understand we're under a certain amount of time pressure. I understand that we have another commitment. Um, so I will pose one last question to you in the interview. I can, I can stay more, uh, 10 more minutes. It's possible Fantastic. also for the audience uh, to come in. Fantastic. So. Um, if I can just, um, I have obviously an endless, I could speak to you for hours, I have an endless list of questions, but I'll, I'll keep it to one more, and then um, we'll open up the questions to the audience. Um, you said recently, Dr. Lisa, that you expect the danger from COVID-19 to decrease next spring. Can you give us some insight into this? Um, for example, in your opinion, when do you think a vaccine is likely to be widely available? Yeah, um, I really think uh, we need to be patient. We need to be disciplined in the next six to eight months because autumn and winter are coming and the virus spreads more easily in closed rooms, 18 times more easily than uh, if you are outside. So that means it will become difficult in autumn and winter. But um, I think, and that was also a quite courageous statement by Sandra Galina, the Deputy Director General of BG Health yesterday in the committee, uh, she's doing a great job, so I, I criticize her with, with the national competence, but she's doing a great job in, in what she's doing with the vaccines. Um, she said, and I, 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 I can confirm this assumption, we cannot promise, but I believe that end of this year or beginning of next year, we will have the first vaccines available. Uh, there are three front runners, according to Mrs. Galina, and I, I, I can uh, confirm this assessment. So it's not a promise, but it's an assessment. Um, BioNTech Pfizer, a uh, European-based company together with U.S. company. Moderna, uh, a U.S. company, but that's partly producing in Europe. And AstraZeneca, uh, consortium with also European players in it, um, may get the approval already this year. And we have already pro procurement agreements. Some are finalized, some are in the process of being finalized these days, that we will get a significant amount of the vaccine already end of this year and then more in, in the start of next year. And um, this comes together, of course, with some other processes. We have obviously some people that by their genetic makeup or by other, other um, immunity issues are not so seriously affected by COVID-19. And some, unfortunately, already went through the, the disease. If this comes together with a vaccination of about 20% of the population and the spring, where we go outside more than, than we do now, we, we may see a step-by-step -step normalization of the, the public life. So we don't need to vaccinate 100% of the citizens. And as I said, we cannot promise maybe one of these projects fails, maybe two, maybe all the three fail, uh, but it's quite likely that we will have a vaccine end of this year, beginning of next year. This is very encouraging news. Um, okay, so we have some, we have quite a lot of questions from the audience, but I know that we are absolutely under time pressure. So I will try to keep it to just a couple. Um, we have a question from, um, excuse me if I butcher the name, uh, Brig Zanen, um, who asks, how are the ambitions of the German presidency being impacted by the budget negotiations? In research and innovation, Germany has big plans, but in the mid to long term, the current budget for Horizon Europe doesn't seem to live up to those plans. Yeah, I fully agree that that is a weak point and a serious point. You know, um, we will have less money available for research in three, four, five years because uh, we will have the recovery plan now, the next generation EU, and some top up of the research budget 
But definitely in the end of the financial period, we will have less money for research than we have today. And I think this is outrageous. Nobody should base a long-term planning on the assumption that research is no longer necessary. This is a key point for the parliament in the negotiation. Um, we will not accept an MFF with less money for research in the end of the MFF period. And I trust in the German government. Again, Angela Merkel is a scientist. She will understand why this is important. And I appeal to all the other member states to really look at the thing. You know, I was quite disappointed with Sebastian Kurz. You know, Sebastian Kurz in a meeting with uh, EPP, public meeting two years ago, said, oh, we need to be more restrictive. Europe needs to spend less money. But in research, we need more. But now his friends, the Frugal Four and himself, pushed the presidency of the council in the direction that definitely the research money will be less um, in the end of the period. So I think uh, Sebastian Kurz should look at this file and re remind his uh, words from the past and uh, give support to a compromise that increases the research budget. Um, we have one last question. Um, well, we have a lot more questions, but I'm going to keep it to one last question. I understand you're up against it time-wise. Um, this comes from Bernard Grimm from Europa Bio Healthcare Technology. He says, my question to Ms. Dr. Peter Lisa, looking at the recovery plan for the EU, could Mr. Lisa elaborate on potential investment of industries of the future? and how he sees the German position on how to prioritise the industries of the future and obviously the biotechnology sector that contributes both to health solutions and economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, personally, I'm not so optimistic that the uh, um, next generation EU will really prioritise the future uh, industries. Uh, we, we should do, and that's also a priority of my political group. But seeing the result of the Council, the European Summit in July, the priorities are very much in the line of the, the national um, politics. So member states can do whatever they want with this money, and there's no double checking that it will really go into the future investments or it is not good enough this double checking i understood that in germany the finance minister even insisted that no additional project will come from next generation eu but all the money we will just use to refinance what germany has already decided to do so there will be no additional European impetus for the economy. Maybe that's justifiable. I, I have my doubts, but that's maybe justifiable for Germany because we have a huge package already, uh, uh, much more than other member states. But if we want to create a European uh, economy, a, a growth impetus for the European economy, uh, then there should be also some additional activity focused on the future. Thank you very much. Um, it's now 10 past 12 and uh, it looks like we've run out of time uh, with Dr. Lisa. He has to leave us now. Many thanks, Dr. Lisa, for your insightful and thought-provoking contributions to this webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to the second part of the webinar where we are joined by two of our EU consultants, Derek Gohl and José Guimaraes, who will be providing you with an insight into the evolution of EU digital energy and climate policy in the coming months against the backdrop of the German EU presidency. Our first speaker, Derek Gohl, is a senior consultant at Dodds working on energy and climate topics. Derek, I give you the floor. Thank you, Laura. Just to give a bit of a framework, the, the German presidency, presidency has until the end of 2020 the possibility to set the agenda of the Council and steer the policies in a certain direction. 
Uh, this presidency will be a short one as the two summer months have already passed and December can only be counted for the first half. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a lot of countries have been waiting for Germany to take charge uh, as it is historically one of the main drivers of the Union. As the European Commission, with its right of initiative, has already set the agenda um, before the German presidency came in, it will be up to the Germans to steer the files in a certain direction. However, the COVID crisis has made this more difficult now, as Dr. Lisa already said. Under the motto, Together for Europe's Recovery, two of the main presidency priorities are climate change and digitalization. I will talk a bit about the energy and climate side uh, and my colleague Jose later about the digital aspect. Uh, next slide, please. And the German presidency and the um, European Commission align very well in yeah, putting the green and digital transition at the center of this recovery. The critics would say that in a period of crisis, it is not the time to invest in climate ambitions, but rather to get the economy going again to save jobs, etc. However, the German presidency and the European Commission are determined to keep this uh, European Green Deal as a priority in the recovery of the European economy. Uh, the Green Deal was proposed before the COVID crisis in December 2019 already and foresees a complete sustainable transition uh, of the European economy towards 2050. In light of the recovery from the COVID crisis, the Commission pushes the Green Deal ahead, arguing that this is the way to make the economy stronger and create new jobs. Next slide. Uh, the German presidency is supportive of the Commission's climate targets for 2030 and 2050. The 2030 target will be proposed later this month and will set the aim of 50 to 55% greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions compared with 1990 levels. This would replace the current 40% figure. And then the target for 2050 will be zero emissions. And the Commission wants to enshrine this into a law, the climate law. The Parliament and Council are currently working on it to get it approved in the upcoming months. And the Parliament's Envy Committee wants to raise the 2030 target to 65% and will vote on its draft report this Friday, uh, the 11th. The European Council, except for Poland, uh, endorsed the 2050 climate target already back in December last year. And the Commission proposal is currently being discussed in the Council's Working Party on the Environment before the Environment Council will establish its uh, final position. Uh, potentially this autumn. And next slide, please. Uh, moving on to the just transition, the presidency is committed to support regions affected by the phasing out of coal-based power uh, in order to support regions that are most affected by the by this green transition, such as coal mining and fossil fuel regions. The Commission has set up this uh, just transition mechanism, which aims to mobilize more than 150 billion euros of investments over the period 21-27. And part of this mechanism is the just transition fund, amounting to 40 billion euros in total. Uh, the Parliament's plenary is expected to vote on the draft report next week. And the Council agreed on a partial negotiating mandate uh, with the precise budget still to be decided uh, upon in light of the MFF. And the Council has agreed that a uh, member state's access to the Just Transition Fund will be cut by 50% if it does not comply with the um, 2050 climate target. Interinstitutional negotiations are expected to start later in the year once the MFF is finalized. And next slide, please. As a final slide, I wanted to show you uh, an overview of the other upcoming initiatives from the um, European Commission in the field of energy. Uh, first of which being an EU strategy on reducing methane emissions uh, to be published this month already. And the strategy will try to reduce methane emissions, which are very pollutant uh, as a byproduct in the fossil fuels, agriculture and waste sectors. 
The renovation wave proposal is also uh, coming out this month, uh, aiming to make the EU building stock more energy efficient. Um, and then the revision of the 10E regulation is foreseen for later this year. This will modernize the EU's energy infrastructure. The sustainable finance strategy will aim to increase private investment in sustainable projects and activities. Uh, the German presidency aims to formulate council conclusions on the European conditions for joint renewable energy projects by member states, particularly in the area of offshore wind power. Uh, this fits together with the upcoming offshore renewable energy strategy coming out later this year. Um, second in line for this uh, trio presidency where Germany uh, is part of, um, it's Portugal. They will take over from Germany at the start of the new year. Following with it, within that period, um, especially the revision of the renewable energy and energy efficiency directives and the carbon border adjustment mechanism are worth mentioning. Uh, the presidency also intends to work on the review of the state aid guidelines in the field of energy and environment. This initiative is expected to be published only in a year's time. Concluding, I would say that the German presidency is very much in line with the European Commission in ambitioning a sustainable, uh, renewable, low carbon recovery of the economy uh, coming out of the COVID crisis. It will support the Commission's Green Deal and the proposals coming up in the following months, trying to reach agreement in the Council. So thank you all for listening and back to you, Lorna. Many thanks, Derek. Um, can I just remind the audience that if you would like to put questions to our two consultants, uh, please do so in the uh, in the chat. Um, and without further ado, our second speaker, Jose Guimaraes, is a political consultant at Dodds for the digital single market. Jose, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Lorna. Welcome everyone. So I'd like to stress that since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic and also of course as a result of the lockdown measures, uh, there has been an acceleration of the transition process towards the digital economy. People are working, meeting and shopping and in increasingly online. This entails both opportunities and risks. Next slide, please. Now, COVID-19 had and will, of course, continue to have an impact at various levels. It has highlighted the importance of ensuring the resilience of key infrastructures uh, and also the online safety of, of citizens, all whilst ensuring that European companies can adapt and thrive in an increasingly digital socioeconomic landscape. Issues such as cybersecurity and the respect for fundamental rights like data privacy, of course, go hand in hand uh, with ensuring competitiveness. At the same time, national governments are taking measures to curb the spread of the virus to safeguard public health. Security here uh, should therefore be understood as being linked not only to public health uh, concerns, such as the ones, for instance, that prompted the closing of national borders, but also to increase risks in the digital realm, which of course also have health implications, such as on mental health. Next slide, please. Now, early in the lockdown, the EU heads of state and government in the European Council, they issued this joint statement uh, acknowledging the importance of integrating the digital transformation in the measures to respond to the crisis. Now, at this point, we should recall that any measures touching upon digital were not to be prepared or deployed within a legal or policy vacuum because in February this year, the Commission had already presented a new digital strategy which comprise the three streams of action, uh, which can read in the slides. And this was accompanied by a white paper on AI and a new data strategy. Now, please note as well that this strategy comprises both an internal and external dimension. Internally, Europe, uh, the strategy argues, should promote trustworthy AI, invest digital in digital skills, strengthen the responsibility of online platforms, fight disinformation, or increase access to high quality data. Another key priority is achieving sovereignty in the digital domain. And here, this is understood as you developing and deploying its own high key capacities um, 
ensuring the integrity and resilience of the used data infrastructure, networks and communications. And this in turn is linked to uh, the objective of ensuring the EU's strategic autonomy. I would recall that Dr. Lise uh, mentioned earlier that uh, the importance of personal protect protective equipment in the field of health, uh, for instance. And then exter externally, the EU should also become a global role model for the digital economy by promoting its own digital standards. Uh, next slide, please. Now, with the, uh, while the outbreak of the pandemic has led the Commission to reassess the timeline of at least some of its planned initiatives, accelerating the digital transition was reaffirmed, actually, by the EU's executive. And investments in programs such as Digital Europe, which uh, is meant to boost investments in supercomputing, AI, cybersecurity, for instance, uh, all remain a priority. While the European Council's political agreement of July uh, set the amount for this program, Digital Europe, just under 6.8 billion, a final agreement, uh, not only for Digital Europe, but also, for instance, for the digital strand of the Connecting Europe facility, this is still to be reached, of course, by the co-legislators. In the meantime, uh, the EU member states had already adopted uh, conclusions on the digital strategy mentioned, mentioned in the previous slides. Um, and these conclusions will also help guide uh, your action in implementing the strategy. Consumer safety and trust, the member states argued, should go hand in hand with strong competitiveness based on a modern framework. And it was at this very important juncture that Germany started its presidency. So key actions foreseen in the German work program should therefore understood as also being linked to the Council conclusions uh, on the digital strategy. We will now only very briefly ha highlight some of these uh, actions foreseen the program and also see how they fit into the planned Commission initiative. Next slide, please. We start with the European Strategy for Data, which was presented last February together with and as part of the digital strategy. It aims to help the EU fulfill the potential of its data economy, enabling data to flow within the EU and across sectors. Later this year, the Commission is expected to propose a legislative framework for the governance of common European data spaces, enabling the sharing of so-called pools of data across economic sectors is one of the key goals. Also, in line with the objective of increasing the EU's strategic autonomy, which we've already mentioned, uh, the signature of a memorandum of understanding with member states on cloud federation, of which member state initiatives such as GAIA-X, for instance, uh, are a component, uh, is foreseen. Uh, tomorrow, at working party level, the Commission is expected to present a draft uh, to member states, uh, as I mentioned, at working party level. A signature is foreseen for later this year, perhaps in Baden-Baden, in informal council in, in October. This is still uh, subject to final uh, confirmation. Then finally, next year, a data act that might address issues affecting relations between actors of the data economy, including B2B and business to government, is expected. Next slide, please. Regarding artificial intelligence, uh, the AI white paper published in February with a strategy uh, laid down the ambition of promoting an ecosystem of excellence together with an, ex with the, with an ecosystem of trust. Now, some developments at EU level should be highlighted in the field of AI, including the development by the high-level expert group on AI of ethics guidelines together with an assessment list for trustworthy AI, or ALTAI. ALTAI is a, basically a checklist uh, for businesses and organizations to self-assess the trustworthiness of their AI systems under, de still under development. However, legislative proposals by the Commission on AI are only due by early next year. But in the meantime, later this year, we'll already have an update of the use coordinated action plan on AI, which should help uh, inter alia um, coordinate action by member states on AI uh, and also create synergies in research and, and innovation funding schemes. It should also essentially help coordinate different national AI strategies. Next slide, please. Later this year, the Digital Services Act package will be presented. We'll be very brief here. But the Commission's stated objective is to modernize the current legal framework for digital services by means of two pillars. First, by clarifying the rules framing the responsibilities of digital services to address the risks faced by their users. 
and second, by proposing, potentially, ex ante rules covering large online platforms acting as so-called gatekeepers. Uh, the Commission argues that it should be possible for platforms to be challenged, the larger ones, by, both by new entrants and by existing competitors. Next slide, please. Cybersecurity. The coronavirus crisis uh, saw increased cyber attacks uh, during the lockdown. Uh, here we'll only highlight three very specific initiatives, one ongoing and two upcoming. So still ongoing, we have the implementation of the U-Toolbox, uh, Toolbox meaning here a common approach by member states on secure 5G de development uh, deployment in the EU. And now this toolbox sets out measures to strengthen security requirements for 5G networks and to apply relevant restrictions for suppliers considered high risk. Then later this year, we'll have the review of the 2016 NIST Directive, through which member states, uh, for instance, set up bodies to supervise cybersecurity while exchanging information with other member states. And finally, a proposal on measures to ensure greater coherence to the EU's overall approach to cri critical infrastructure. Uh, protection is also foreseen for later this year, and we'll also have to see how this later initiative will link uh, to the outcome of the, of the implementation of the 5G toolbox. Next slide, please. We're already reaching the end of the presentation. Uh, we would like to highlight another development, uh, something to keep an eye on, which are the negotiations at council level concerning the privacy regulation which was proposed back in 2017 to replace the 2002 e-privacy directive. Now, whether a mandate to start negotiations with the Parliament on this file will be reached or not during this presidency, and if so, whether the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic impacted these negotiations uh, in any way, uh, is one of the open questions in the coming months. Next slide, please. Before ending the presentation, uh, we would like to mention a topic which, as you know, has been the subject of much discussion in European media, which is mobile contact tracing apps. Earlier this year, in the context of the lifting of the confinement measures, the Commission sought to support member states in reaching a common approach, uh, a, a toolbox, for mobile uh, tracing apps across the EU. Now, as you see, uh, this topic also features in the program of the German presidency. Now, this is a health issue, of course, but it is also linked to much of what was mentioned in our presentation, because it also touches upon issues like trust, data privacy, cybersecurity, fundamental rights, as well as the reopening um, of our economies. Finally, in the next and final slides, we leave you with an overview of just a few of the digital initiatives to keep an eye on. Thank you all for listening. Back to you, Lorna. Many thanks, Josie. Um, I see that we have some questions for Derek and Josie from our audience, so we can begin a brief Q&A session. Um, our first question is for Josie, and this is coming from Daniela Schneider. Uh, she asks, will there be a system of identification when selling online any kind of goods? What about social media channels? And she's referring to the Digital Services Act. Thank you for, thank you for, for this question. Uh, it should be recalled that the precise uh, content of the Digital, Digital Services Act, uh, this will only be known, of course, uh, later this year in Q4, when the proposal will actually be um, be presented by these executives, the, the, the Commission. There's a number of uh, open issues, uh, including when it comes to ex ante regulation, what will be mandatory, what will be voluntary. Um, on digital on identification uh, when selling online, um, I would refer, also recall that digital identity, um, which also links in a, in a way, um, will be one of the topics that the Commission is expected uh, to address later this year. Uh, I would recall that Council conclusions uh, published in June had called upon the Commission to review existing legislation on the creation of um, reliable interop. Um, and technologically neutral uh, framework for digital identity, 
which should also help safeguard the competitive edge, uh, edge of European businesses. And the Commission, of course, also in the context uh, of the lessons learned uh, by the COVID um, during the lo during the lockdown, um, uh, the Commission is of the view that citizens should be provided um, and businesses, of course, with a universally ac uh, ac accepted and trusted digital identity also to allow access to private and crucial uh, sensitive uh, public online services such as in in e-health um for the rest uh, as i as i mentioned this is just an an, an example um but uh, further details uh, all is very much still open and we'll need to wait, to wait for the publication of the of the actual digital services act later this year uh, to know the exact mo modalities and the scope um, of the new law. Thank you, Josie. Uh, we now have a question for Derek. Uh, this is coming from Jan Kramer um, regarding the Just Transition Fund. Um, he says, besides national co-financing, member states slash regions will have to allocate ERDF slash ESF of max maximum 20% of the Just Transition Fund allocation. This is heavily debated in the regions as it reduces their scope of activities in the ERDF programmes. Do you think this regulatory proposal by the European Commission will still change? For example, will it be reduced or completely abolished? Thank you, Jan, for the, for the question. Um, I think it will depend first on the, the MFF, obviously the negotiations, um, what will be decided as the overall budget, along which all the specific budgets uh, can be determined. Um, and then obviously the interinstitutional negotiations uh, will have to take place. Usually the, the parliament is, uh, is in favor of, of more funds um uh, rather than less so i would say yeah the parliament um doesn't want to have strict uh yeah like um blockades for that uh, and then the member states it will depend uh which member state obviously if the member state is expected to receive a lot of uh, regional uh structural funds uh, then it wants to have these um yeah these higher um amounts but uh, that will really depend on the um, on the member state. I would. I hope that's an answer to your uh, to your question. Many thanks, Derek. Um, now, as a final question um, for both uh, both panelists, this is from Celine Diebold. Uh, she says, um, "Thank you for the contributions. What do you think could the conference on the future of Europe and the EU citizens play a role in addressing both issues?" I, I can start if, uh, if that's okay. Um, thank you for the question, Celine. I think um, definitely citizens can play a role for the for the climate and energy part. We've already seen the last uh, two years with all these um, demonstrations in the streets uh, that uh, this really is a concern for uh, for citizens. Also, the the polls, the Eurostat polls, show that uh, citizens uh, care about the climate as a top uh, priority. Um, so yes, uh, I think this will be crucial and politicians will see that as well. Obviously their election base uh, needs to be based on what citizens uh, want. So the whole political specter is moving more towards the green uh, side, I would say. And then on the conference uh, on the future of Europe, uh, obviously this is also intended to involve uh, young people and uh, look ahead uh, look ahead quite far so 2030 2050 and with the commission now um, putting these uh, climate law and climate neutrality targets in place i think um, it's definitely um, yeah going to play a role this conference and the citizens especially the, the young people thank you derek uh, jose do you have a comment on this question uh, Dirk already said, um, I believe, uh, many of the most, most important things. I would only like to stress uh, that uh, at a time when our lives are becoming increasingly digital, because we're doing more and more uh, things in the digital uh, realm and increasingly present in social media, uh, the way democracy and the way participation at the EU level, a democracy at the EU level, uh, and the way 
the digital um, the digital participation in democracy is thought, it's considered and implemented, is something that will definitely be part of the discussion because if young people, as Dirk mentioned, uh, they do want to be engaged and there are signs that they do want to, ways uh, of doing it and the, the way the digital challenges also pose challenges or not for democ democracy and the way digital might actually contribute uh, to, uh, to promoting democracy and increasing participation and the quality in democracy this could also be a part of the discussion, definitely. Many thanks, Jose. Um, I think that uh, just about wraps it up for the um, Q&A session following the presentations. I now pass the floor back to David to conclude. All, all, all is left to do is uh, to say thank you, Dr. Lisa, thank you, Dirk, and thank you, uh, Jose, uh, for your insightful contributions. And thank you, Lorna, for guiding us through all these complex issues uh, with your questions. And I'd like to thank all the participants for bearing uh, with us at the start and for, for sticking uh, around a bit longer and for enriching the conversation with your questions. Uh, should you have any questions regarding the strategic partnership between politics and DODS uh, and all our, our combined uh, service offerings, feel free to contact Julian uh, or I anytime. Uh, thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, goodbye.